Greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is still doing well, and welcome to tonight's second half. Before we jump into tonight's second half, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support this channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe, it doesn't cost you a cent. Click that like button, takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all these things really do help this channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, folks, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to tonight's second half, shall we? Today's first encounter. My partner and I like to hike at a local park late at night. It's a historic park in Pennsylvania. I'd say maybe 3,500 acres in size that spans over into Delaware and Maryland. One of the trails allows you to cross through all three states. The entire park is mostly dense wood with a creek that runs through it. Usually we park near an old church with a Revolutionary War cemetery that is famous for a grave known as the Ticking Tomb. I've been to every corner of this park day and night. We usually hike a short loop that is roughly a half a mile in length. We've walked this trail literally thousands of times and never once had anything strange happen. But this evening was totally different. We made a spontaneous decision to go on a night hike and left the house at around 10.45 p.m. I decided to take the narrow dirt road to our usual parking spot rather than driving a mile up the road to a paved access road like we normally do. About halfway down this ragged dirt and gravel road as we rounded the corner this creature dashed across the road in the path of our headlights. I have never seen anything like this creature and I've never seen an animal that size in this area that I could not immediately identify. The size was somewhere between that of a dog and a human, and it moved so quickly that it looked like it flew. A literal black blur with some hazy details and bright silver eyes. My partner saw it as well. I'm generally a skeptic, so I immediately wrote it off, and we both kind of just explained it away. We made it to the parking spot and pretty much resolved not to talk about it and continued on as usual. Immediately, when we got onto the trail, we noticed the frogs and cicadas were extremely loud, louder than I had ever heard them at night around here. As we progressed down this trail, it felt like we had to talk over the cicadas. We sort of quietly, frantically attempted to lighten the mood with conversation. Unbeknownst to me at the time, about a hundred meters down this trail, my partner had begun to hear what he thought was extremely distant voices. I also noticed the cicadas got progressively quieter the further we went down this trail. We made it about a quarter mile before a sudden loud sound felt like it cut through the space between my ears. It was something like a glitching microphone or megaphone off in the distance. My partner pointed out to me later that there was nothing for an echo to bounce off in that area. The moment we heard it, I stopped immediately and asked if he had heard it as well. Not only had he heard it, but he was convincing himself that he was hallucinating the sounds the entire time, until I finally acknowledged it. Without a discussion, we both immediately turned around and started walking at a fast pace back to the car. I felt like it was a bad idea to run, but... We had to leave right away. 
We hoofed it back to the car with a feeling that something was following us all the way to the entrance. When we finally got back into the car and started driving, that feeling of urgency did not go away. We made it all the way down that main road to our first turn, and I felt a moment of complete confusion. As I slowed to turn, my partner asked, Do you not know where you are right now? Because neither do I. We have literally driven this road thousands of times. I made a split-second decision to turn right, which was thankfully the right choice. The next road went along the perimeter of the park in parallel with the trail we were hiking. There was tons of fog, which hadn't been, in our way in. We spent maybe 20 minutes at this park in total. Just as we made our way past the area that we had turned around, another creature darted across the road in front of our headlights. It looked exactly like the one we saw on our way in, only closer and in more detail. It had silver eyes and what looked to be large ears. It was still insanely fast and either a blur or a wraith. I don't know how else to describe it. I get this really weird feeling when I think or talk about it. The feeling started when I saw it run across the road the second time. I feel like it was because I acknowledged that whatever this thing was, I couldn't explain it. I feel an almost burning sensation in my sinuses, my eyes water, and I get a strange tingling in the back of my skull. Like I said before, I'm usually a skeptic when it comes to things like this. But this experience has left me rattled. Tonight's second encounter. My wife and I work in television, and it requires a lot of traveling and a lot of late-night car rides. We live in Florida, and my wife had to go to Georgia for work. Because we take so many planes, we sometimes decide when it's a four- to seven-hour ride, we'll just drive it out. Believe me, after 20-plus years of being on planes... Being able to drive every once in a while is a blessing because you get so fed up with sitting on planes. It was about 11.30 when her brother texted me to pick up the phone when she calls, which I thought was odd because why wouldn't I pick it up? As soon as I'm reading the text, I get a frantic phone call from my wife. Now, please understand that my wife does not subscribe to any cryptid or paranormal stuff. I, however, most certainly do. So for her to be this freaked out and panicked means something crazy had gone down. She starts talking really fast and I cannot understand anything of what she's saying. So eventually I tell her to calm down and tell me what's going on. She starts telling me, I've seen one of those things you sometimes talk about, the documentary thing. Still kind of puzzled, I ask her, what docu-thing exactly? She replies, the wolf thing, the human wolf, dog man, yes. She's driving down from Georgia and is still at this point two hours removed from our house. And we are located just above Tampa. So she's already driving in Florida. But she's driving down this 45 mile an hour road to give you an idea of the road itself. So not a big broad road. As she's making a turn, her lights hit. What she at the moment thought was a man standing bent over on the side of the road. She figures that's really odd because who would be standing in the middle of the night on a small, not lit road? Then as the light is hitting it more and more, she realizes that there is something off here as the light is climbing up as she gets closer, revealing that the arms are completely covered in fur. And it's reaching to pick something off the ground. She also sees massive hands. Then, when it is fully lit, this thing is hunched over and is already standing at seven feet and starts to move up. She sees a complete canine head with pointed ears backward. She tells me that everything, despite going pretty fast, it's like everything had slowed down. So that her brain can make sense of all this, she tells me that it has really long, thin arms, very muscular though, short fur with longer fur at its back and neck, also where the thighs meet. By the time she passes it, it almost stands up completely, 
and has not once yet looked in her direction or even acknowledged the car or the light. And it is as if this thing does not care she is even there. She tells me that she was on the phone with her brother when she saw this thing. And she started screaming when she saw it, causing her brother to also freak out and ask her what was going on and what she was seeing, which is when she rambles on to him and tells him she's going to call me. After she tells me this experience, I calm her down, tell her not to get out of the car anymore until she gets home, and asks her if she has enough gas to make it home without stopping at a gas station, which thankfully she did. She carries a firearm on her, but there is no way she was going to stand a chance against this thing if it decided to go to her car or for her. We talk a bit, as I can tell she is in shock, and she tells me that she is trying to make sense of it. She wonders if anyone from YouTube prankster to someone just in a suit trying to create sightings but none of those things make any sense as it never leads to anything. And that road is completely deserted in the middle of nowhere. Now, does that rule any of it out? No, but nonetheless, it was a sighting. And for my wife, it was very real. After we hung up, I kept making sure she was okay and got so spooked, especially because I enjoy a lot of cryptid stuff and realizing that two hours away from our house, that is pretty remote and surrounded by acres of land and woods, isn't that far, I grabbed my 308 M1A SOCOM and basically sat downstairs waiting to hear the garage so I could come and greet her. And when she did, she was still a bit shaken. We spoke about it with some friends and family members days after. Today's third encounter is an encounter that I heard back in 2021. Um, I'd love to have this gentleman on the show. I know that he was on another channel. Um, I had found this uh, <clears throat> on an online news uh, news forum, but this news forum is actually a physical newspaper out of Michigan, which I found it compelling because. It's strange, even questionable, why a news agency would publish this. Usually they don't. Um, my local paper, the Post Star, does publish some Bigfoot experiences when, they, when they've been reported. But this is just very strange that they would even... And maybe it's because it's in Michigan and the Michigan Dogman... Uh, maybe that has something to do with it, but let's get into it. A truck driver and a six-year Army veteran was transporting a 43,000-pound load of paper from a mill in northern Michigan through a forest on his typical route when he encountered the dogman on an evening in June. He had said that he had never heard of this cryptid before the incident, which took place within 15 to 20 seconds at most. I would swear as a Christian on the Bible that this is all 100% factual truth, Barger said. Leading up to the encounter, Barger realized while driving he had an air leak. He wanted to fix it before he got too far into the forest. He stopped to have a look at it. He found the air leak by the back brake chamber of the trailer. With the materials to fix it, Barger positioned himself underneath the trailer and began to get a bad feeling. I was hearing a vocalization that was not natural, Barger said in this article. It wasn't a sound that I had ever heard before. I was looking around and I saw some shadows in the wood line. But there was plenty of light to see. It was nowhere near getting dark yet. I was in bear country, so I perceived the shadow to be a black bear at the time. When I realized I could be near a black bear, I got back into my truck and checked out the air, which was good to go. It held and took me not even five minutes to fix, Barger states. 
The woods continued to give Barger a bad feeling, but he thought everything was normal until he was driving again. He checked his driver's side mirror for any traffic on this two-lane road, and at the bottom of the hill there was none. As he started going up the hill, and he looked to his right side, he saw it was darker than it should be. There was a wolf head the size of my window, and my windows were down. Barger said in this article, It was trotting along next to me, and I was going at least 25 miles an hour. And he was stooping down on two legs to look inside the cabin of my rig. I'm nine feet tall in my seat. His hands were coming up, scratching my windowsill. On my door handle, I could hear his claws. Time seemed to slow down, Barger states. I thought I was in an alternate reality or something because this creature doesn't exist in our reality. I've never known anything like this. I've heard of Bigfoot, and I know those to be something that is talked about, but this was something far different. Bigfoot has nothing on the dog man, according to Barger. It has a lot of sharp teeth, and the teeth on this thing were a brilliant white, Barger said. Three inches long, fangs, bottom and top, pure black, pointed ears. It had yellowish eyes, human-like hands, probably 14 inches across. It was at least 10 feet from how it was stooping into my cabin. Its brilliant yellow eyes were darting all over the place and looking at me. How this creature looked was mad and determined to get me, Barger continues. He was sneering. He wasn't making any noises vocally, but the looks he was giving me and the intelligence in his eyes was telling me, I am here to get you and there is nothing you are going to do about it. Barger thought about trying to roll up his window, but decided to focus on keeping the truck on the road. That is when he remembered his handgun. He pulled out his forty-five Colt strapped to his waist and took two shots at this creature. He instantly went down, Barger says. I was looking at him as he was sliding into the weeds. I was at almost point-blank range, so I'm pretty sure I got him through the eye orbit. His head was huge. Everything on this creature was black except its teeth and eyes. I wasn't panicked. But it is the scariest thing I've ever had in my life happen. Barger, assuming the creature was dead, wanted to turn around and check on the carnage to make sure that he was not losing his mind. About a mile up the road, he found a spot large enough to turn the truck around. I wanted to make sure that it was dead. I wanted to know more about what had just happened. As Barger was coming back down the hill... At almost five minutes after the shooting, it was gone. In its place was a jeep and two people. Barger said he was concerned about the people being somewhere potentially dangerous, so I stopped and talked to them. They gave me a story that they were watching a few bears fighting each other. I was worried about them being outside with what had just happened, but I didn't want to let them know what I had just done, so I left. Barger thinks because the other people claim to have seen two bear that maybe there could have been more dog man in the area beside the one he had shot. I was really in shock for a good while. I was still driving the truck and I didn't even know how I got back. I should have been driving the truck in this I shouldn't have been driving the truck in this state of mind I was in, but I wasn't going to stay around or park anywhere near there. It was the most terrifying thing I think anybody could go through, worse than even a combat situation, because at least you know what you're dealing with at that point. I've had nightmares for six months to a year, on and off. The nightmares got less prevalent as time went on, and I really don't deal with them anymore. I'm in a lot better shape now, and I thought it was important to get this info out. That's my experience. It just took me a long time to get it out to the right people that I know will have my back. 
Additionally, Barger claims the federal government is keeping the existence of Dogman quiet, which we know. After I got better from the nightmares, I had a family member tell me I should get this out to the public. So I started to reach out to folks, and I met up with one podcaster. Three months later, Barger said he was detained at a scale house by the state police to wait for federal authorities. When they, the federal authorities, finally showed up, they were very intimidating and angry, he said. I didn't know what was going on. They said, you killed one of our assets, and this is how things are going to go down. Barger knew the only thing he killed in the last year was that creature. This is their property, and they were mad that I killed it, and they are trying to get me to stop talking about it. They probably knew who I was. Barter said the federal authorities threatened him, confiscated his gun, and shut his bank account down for some time. I have stopped talking about it until recently. This is probably another tool in their toolbox for military operations. And if they don't keep it under wraps, it won't be a useful tool for them anymore. The dog man has been on the minds of Michigan lenders for the last 130 years, starting in 1887. That's when two lumberjacks saw this creature they described as having a man's body and a dog head. According to the legend, the dog man appears to humans in a 10-year cycle that falls on years ending in the number seven, according to the Michigan History Center. Barger's encounter happened in 2017. So, really quick, this really tells us everything that Victor has told us because this gentleman's experience came out after Victor was on my show um, on a totally different channel, a channel much larger than mine. Um, <clears throat> but for him to share his experience, then get detained because he shot one is nuts. Um, I do believe he had shared his name actually on the, on the show that he was on. Uh, just an incredible, incredible experience. And I'm going to work on getting him on the show, uh, because I think it would be definitely, um, with everything that Victor shared with us, what Steph, private contractor, Luke, um, and many of you, all, pretty much all of you actually have shared uh, the gentleman Texas who had seen a UFO called MUFON and had an agent show up claiming that he was on, from MUFON. Turns out he wasn't. Then turns out there was a dog man in his front yard intimidating him to shut his mouth. These things are an asset. These things are a weapon. And tonight's final encounter. As a young teen, I lived in a very strange situation in the woods. I'm not sure if this encounter may have been some kind of entity or perhaps something much different. I sure hope someone can shed some light on what happened to my friend and I. At the time, my friend Alex's dad had purchased a large amount of forested land around 100 kilometers away from the city we lived in, Montreal, Canada. It was all forest when Alex's family acquired it. They cleared a little patch and built a home. The rest was pure, unadulterated forest. Their land was cut in two by a dirt road, and if you followed that dirt road a few kilometers, led you to a couple of houses. Their land was very different depending on which side of the road you looked. On the right side, where their home was, the forest was light and luminous, or at least it felt that way. It was not too dense with little rolling hills, a lovely place to live and play. On the left side of the road, though, was another story. First, there was this deep ditch, perhaps two meters deep, which then became a quite high and steep hill. Weirdly enough, all along the road, the ditch was full of car, car parts, a set of car tires here, a door there, a steering wheel way over there, all overgrown and covered in moss. And over that steep hill, the forest gave off a really bad vibe. 
It had lots of very tall, dark pine with almost black trunks, and the place seemed somehow devoid of life and light. Climbing the hill, which we seldom were willing to do because of the creeps it gave us, there was a sort of swamp there. When we were there, there was this strange pressure. We sensed a kind of animal instinct telling us to leave the place. The strange atmosphere was spontaneously obvious to both of us, and we playfully called that side of the road Demon Forest. On a weekend, maybe in 2002, my family went to visit Alex's family and we were bored. So me and Alex decided to go and play. Alex's dad told us to watch out that there was an animal rummaging through his trash bin, causing other nuisances. He said that it was a dog and it looked somewhat like a Rottweiler that surely belonged to someone living on this dirt road. He warned us not to interact with the dog if we saw it, as it did not look healthy, as far as he could tell, or something was weird about it. He said it looked diseased and it had patches of fur missing. I can't remember exactly. We set out on our walk. It was autumn. The leaves were pretty and golden, many having already fallen to the ground. It was a calm, slightly overcast, windless day. The air was very still and calm. Alex and I decided to walk the dirt road with a pleasant section of the forest to our right and demon forest to the left. We chatted while following the road as it was rising up a slope. As usual, we were slightly creeped out going up this road because of the weird vibes of the forest to the left. But we were challenging ourselves to be brave and trying not to really think about how unsettling it had felt. A good distance away from their house, when it was already well out of sight, I noticed the first strange thing of the day. Out of the steep hill on the left side of the road, there was a very large and dark pine tree hanging over the road. Somebody had attached a pink ribbon to one of the branches, which was already strange, since this was Alex's property. And they had no daughters or any other little girls hanging out, or other people who may be owners of pink ribbons who were likely going to hang them out on this deserted road. The strange thing was the ribbon was flailing strongly in the wind. Its loose ends were flapping almost horizontally. The thing is, it was a completely windless day. There was no wind at all. The ribbon was within my reach, so I even touched it as it was flailing. I even licked my finger and held it in the air to check and see where the wind current was, as my dad had taught me. The air was perfectly still, yet the ribbon flailed. I mentioned it to Alex, and he seemed distracted and was younger than me and sometimes didn't catch on to what I was saying, so I didn't press the matter. We continued our hike. We reached a place where the hill on the left side of the road had a gentler slope and begun further away from the road. In fact, it looked as if the hill was kind of carved out of the way. It would have made it easier for us to climb into Demon's Forest. It almost seemed as if the hill was carved in a sloping half circle, like in a theater, and the road we stood on would have been the stage. It gave us a very clear, treeless view of the hillside, full of golden and red fallen leaves. The trees began at the top of the hill, maybe nine meters higher. We stopped to admire the view. Canadian autumns are a sight to behold. So are in upstate New York's and Vermont's and New Hampshire's. Just kidding. Alex suddenly got very excited. He thought he had heard something in Demon Woods up the hill, and he really wanted me to pay attention. He explained that there was wild cats in the forest, and they had spotted them with his dad. One of them had reportedly had kittens, kittens being one of the most exciting things in the world for kids our age, getting us all riled up, but somehow my hackles were up, and I could not relax, even thinking about an adorable wild cat. He actually thought he had heard a cat meow in the forest up the hill close by. 
I heard nothing of the sort and thought he was inventing it. He vehemently suggested that we try try meowing at it and see if it responds. Maybe it would even bring its kittens along and we could see them and play with them, he said. I hadn't heard any sound at all and didn't really like the idea of screaming meows into a creepy forest. What kind of wild cat would respond to a human to a human child playing? Wouldn't it be obvious that we were not cats by the sound of us? That seemed like a dumb idea to me. Before I could talk him out of it, he l- loudly meowed into the forest to my utter shock. The forest meowed back. Alex was delighted and meowed again. Something in that forest answered again. I was actually shocked. This didn't make any sense to me and creeped me out as well. But I suspended my disbelief to see what would happen. He kept meowing over and over. For every one of his meows, there was one coming back in his response from the woods. Something felt off to me. Feral or wild animals do not behave like this. Even at my age, I realized that. And it was not an echo. The cat didn't bounce back any sound that we threw at all except meows. There were no hard rock surfaces around for which this sound, which the sound would bounce off. Everything was covered in a soft layer of sound dulling leaves. Alex got more excited. Listen, the cat's coming towards us. She's coming to see us with her kittens. To my surprise, he was right. There was a rustle of dead leaves coming above us. From above the slope in that creepy forest, it seemed like that rustling was getting closer. But it was a ways off, because cats are small and light and careful with their steps. They didn't make a ruckus when they walked through the forest. But here the leaves were rustling and extremely obvious along with the meowing. And in fact, it sounded more like steps, like something with two legs walking through the forest. And it was getting closer. My alarm signals were starting to go off with the wrongness of it all. While my younger friend was oblivious, he was calling it more vehemently, noticing that it was coming towards us. Then I realized what seemed so wrong. The sound was coming towards us, but there was nothing to be seen right in front of us. We had a gently sloping hill, timeless and clearly visible. Anything coming from that forest should have been plentifully exposed to the view. There was nothing, no source for the rustling, nothing, no movement. Oh, her kittens are joining her. Listen, there's more sounds. They're coming to play with us, Alex said. He was right. The walking sound seemed to have multiplied and now came from various directions, ever getting closer with nothing visible. Something was off. I wanted to leave, but Alex was mad at me. The kittens were almost here and he wanted to see them. He insisted. At this point, it was extremely tense and fight or flight had activated from the wrongness of it all. We're alone and quite exposed in this theater-like stage. Whatever is getting closer to us, which was more and more obvious, with every moment decidedly not kittens. I was on the verge of forcing him to run, and then suddenly I heard a very loud panting sound. During the first millisecond, I was only mildly surprised. We had a huge husky at home. I was used to that panting, but then the sense of profound dread downed on me as I realized, obviously, my dog was not here, and this must be another dog, a very big one from the sounds of it. I panicked, looking around, ready to jump away from this dog that somehow got extremely close to us, only there was absolutely nothing around, just the sound that I could hear loudly breathing and panting coming from the wood line. I whirled around all 360 degrees, screaming, where's it coming from? There was nothing at my feet or anywhere around me. There was nothing there. 
yet the sound was clearly there. As I whirled about in a frenzy, I looked up the dirt road we were following. Around a hundred meters away, on the top of the slope, I saw this lone, huge canine standing there. It looked somewhat similar to a Rottweiler, but very, very large and extremely unkept, with what seemed to be patches of fur missing, with some skin exposed where the fur was supposed to be. It had these reddish glistening eyes and it was looking right down at us. Obviously, there was no way that I could hear it panting from that distance and the source of the sound. At that point, the flight instinct wins inside of me. I have never ran as desperately and as fast in my whole life and thank goodness it was downhill. Alec kept pace right with me, terrified. We made it home in one piece. We did not walk in those woods anymore. I came back to Alex's house several times in my life. I never wanted to walk those woods again. We had amazing parties at his house when we were older. I was often there rather drunk and having a great time, but I always had this very stressful sensation when I went outside, especially at night. When I slept over, I had these extremely strange experiences where when I woke up, I sensed as if something was looking through the windows observing me. In my mid-awake state, I even saw something staring through the window. I don't know exactly what it was, but we never discussed it. As I research now, I see this land is historically Algonquin land. Wow, what a horrific group of experiences. Horrific and informative. Very interesting. I hope you guys enjoyed them as much as I enjoyed sharing them all with you. I'd like to thank you all for supporting the channel. After all, your support is what makes this channel continue to grow and go and what makes it special. A safe place for people to share their experiences without judgment, ridicule, be able to share their experiences and ideas and theories without judgment and ridicule. And that's all because of you. Thank you. Everyone, please stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, our pets, our family, and friends. These creatures are real. They are out there, and they are dangerous. Share this information with the people you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions. Never stop searching for the truth, and God bless.